Covenant Church. There we go. Uh, good to see your faces this morning. Uh, glad that you've come to gather for worship with one another. Uh, if you are visiting us today, we're so glad that you're here. Uh, we'd love to greet you. If you want any information on the church, it's in the back um, at the information desk. Uh, if you are joining us online today, we're glad that you chose to join us online for worship. So welcome. Um, I want to uh, start with just a couple announcements. First, thank you to everybody that made uh, last week our Roundup Sunday success, all the different help that went into that. It was a really wonderful time of fellowship um, to kick off the year where everything's starting. And uh, we had a great uh, first Wednesday together where we had food and we studied God's Word and the kids had fun. So um, really feeling uh, wonderful so far. We had uh, this weekend a men's fellowship and Bible study that happened. So there is a lot going on. I want to highlight a couple more for you. Um, grief share is underway. Um, if you uh, or uh, someone you know uh, could use a group to walk through grief with. Grief Share is a great space for that. Um, I want to plug again at the end of the month, Sunday the 25th, we have a young adult small group, and we're really allowing this young adult to be pretty expansive. So, you know, if you're out of high school and, and you're somewhere even into your early 30s, we want you to feel comfortable to come to this and depending on who arrives, we can always break this down into further small groups. So I know Mark and Sarah are excited for this. I'm excited for it. Um, it's at 7 p.m. at Porch Lake Covenant Bible Camp on Sunday the 25th. Um, choir rehearsals are underway, and they're always accepting new members if you want to be a part of the choir. If you have questions, you can talk to Mert. Uh, Bible Study Fellowship is happening Wednesdays at 10 a.m. here at the church. Uh, we have, again, our Wednesday evenings where there is a free meal at 5.30, followed by breakouts into all of our different groups. If you're not joining us for that, consider doing so. It's great fellowship. It's time of discipleship where we get into the Word together. Um, it's, a wonderful, it's a wonderful thing. Um, we also have a fall women's retreat coming up at Portage Lake Covenant Bible Camp, the 30th through October 2nd. Um, if you would like to register for that, uh, go to portagelake.org. Um, and then I want to plug again, every Saturday, 9 a.m., we've got men invited to come to church. Um, we're going to have fellowship. We're going to do some study, some devotional thoughts. Um, we're going to support each other. We're going to sharpen each other. Um, so make an effort. Come to that if you can. We'd really like to grow that and make something that, something that you can depend on from uh, week to week. Uh, it's also going to be something that we're going to run uh, lay-led. So if you are a part of that and you'd like to take it for a couple weeks with some devotional thoughts, uh, you can talk to myself. Uh, we got Mike Warniak doing that right now, uh, but we'd like to keep that going. And then we also just started all of our Sunday school classes this morning. So if you joined us for that, um, hope that you enjoyed that. If you didn't, want to encourage you. We've got two different offerings for adults every week. And you can get all the information on that at the information desk. And then for all of our different kids' age groups, we have breakouts. And that all starts at 9.30 in the morning. Um, I'll let you take a look at the rest of the announcements and everything yourself. But why don't we stand and let's greet our neighbors this morning. Okay, I'm going to draw us back together. Uh, I encourage you to continue that visiting after the service today. Uh, we're going to join in our call to worship. Blessed is the one who trusts in the Lord.
Many, Lord my God, are the wonders you have done, the things you have planned for us. Nothing can compare with you. Were I to speak and tell of your deeds, they would be too many to declare. Blessed are those whose hope is in God. Amen. introduced this song a month or so ago. Uh, it's just a simple song. It's a song about trusting Jesus. Uh, we invite you to join in as you're comfortable. Try. 
God, help us to trust you with everything we have, that all we are. God, may we be, as we worship here, hearts that are open to you. If you are knocking this morning, God, may we open the door. Speak to us. Change us. Upset us. Prepare us, God. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning. Our first reading will be from Amos chapter 8, verse 4 to 7. Hear this, you who trample the needy and do away with the poor of the land, saying, When we when will the new moon be over that we may sell the grain and the Sabbath be ended that we may market wheat, skipping on the measure, boosting the prices, and cheating with the nest, dishonest scales, buying the poor with silver and the needy for a pair of sandals, selling even the sweepings with the wheat. The Lord has sworn by himself, the pride of Jacob, I will never forget anything they have done. Our second reading will be from Luke chapter 16, verse 1 through 16. Jesus told his disciples, there was a curse was a rich man whose manager was accustomed of wasting his possessions. So he called him in and asked him, what is this I hear about you? Give an account of your management because you can no manage, you cannot be manager any longer. The manager said to himself, what shall I do now? My master is taking away my job. I'm not strong enough to dig and I'm not, and I'm ashamed to beg. I know what I, I'll do so that when I lose my job here, people will welcome me into their houses. So he called in each one of his master's debtors, and he asked, how much do you owe my master? 900 gallons of olive oil, he replied. The manager told him, take your bill, sit down quickly, and make it 450. Then he asked the second, how much do you owe? A thousand bushels of wheat, he replied. He told them, take your bill and make it 800. The master complained in dishonest manager because he had acted shrewdly. For the people of this world are more, more shrewd in dealing with their own kinds than they are people of the light. I tell you, use worldly wealth for your for yourselves so that when it, when it is gone, you will be welcomed in internal dwellings. You can be trusted with very little, can be trusted with very much. And whoever is dishonest with very little will also be dishonest with much. So I tell you, wealth will trust you with true riches. And if you have not been trustworthy with someone else's property, you will give your property of your own. No one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. Choir is happy to be, to be back today and singing with with you in the, uh, the service. And uh, if anybody, if any of you are singers and want to join us, we meet every Thursday night for rehearsal and then sing on Sundays. So this morning we are going to sing "It Is Well with My Soul."
Thank you, choir. It's good to have the choir back, isn't it? I have a couple uh, additions to our prayer concerns this morning. Um, first of all, uh, Jane Fritz um, has a uh, grand nephew um, that had a stroke on his honeymoon. And um, Scott came up to me also and mentioned it. I think his first name was Connor. Um, and it's just a really a, a freak thing. Um, he's in the hospital down south right now, but um, we'll be praying for Connor and for his uh, um, new wife. Um, just an un, unimaginable kind of a thing. So we'll be praying for him. Um, also, um, a correction on uh, it's Marie Reese that we're praying for, not Mary. And then um, I have an update on Marie Ketz, who we've been praying for. Uh, I think most of you probably saw Marie um, had fallen and she broke, uh, fractured a, a number of bones. Um, she was then in um, the Meadow Lodge in Ludington, where she suffered a stroke. Um, from there, she went to the ICU, and she is, she's now home with her daughter, Lori, um, and she's on hospice. And she's, she's not been responsive, and Lori's expecting that she will be called home in a matter of days. So uh, be praying for Marie um, and for, for Marie's family. Uh, I, I can speak um, that Marie was ready to go home and meet her Lord, um, so you need not worry about that. But uh, it's, it's hard, no matter what, to lose somebody that we love. Uh, so be in prayer for them and their family. Are there any uh, others? Yes, yeah, Steve? Okay, I missed the name. Adam? Adam is going to have a procedure on what day? A kidney stone, okay. Okay, so praying for Adam is going to have a procedure to remove a kidney stone. Okay, anyone else? Yes, Brian. Okay, um, Lorelai Nidowski is the last name you said, um, diagnosed with lung cancer. Uh, we'll be praying for Lorelai. Anyone else? Yep, Bev. Okay, so I think you were saying, Bev, that there's some connections between the, the family um, and, and Christian Ludwig as well family. Okay, so we, yeah, there we'll be praying. They've got things going on multiple directions right now. Yep. Okay. And Joy's going to kidney doctor on Tuesday. Yvonne, granddaughter going to specialist. Okay. Anyone else? One behind me. Okay, yeah. Yes, Jane. Okay, that's you. And you said it was Todd? Todd and Trish. Todd um, having some problems with heart where he's on a kidney machine um, and things like that. And then Trish with some Caesars, Caesars you said? Okay, okay. Seizures. Okay. All right, let's pray together. Gracious God, we come before you now as your people, the body of Christ. And Lord God, we come in trust. We trust your will 
We trust your ways, even if we don't understand them. But God, even as we trust you and your will, we also recognize, God, you ask us to come and make our requests known. And so, Lord, we pray um, for Adam, who is um, going to have a procedure for kidney stones. We pray for healing, God, and for a, a successful procedure. We pray for Lorelai, uh, who has been diagnosed with lung cancer. God, we ask for healing. Um, Lord, and we also ask that you would be with her, with the rest of the family. God, these kinds of diagnoses are so hard. So, Lord, we pray that your peace and comfort would be there. Um, God, uh, where, where nothing else can, can touch, God. I pray for Joy, who is going to her kidney doctor, Lord, for um, uh, a good report or a good idea of what to do next for her, God, and we ask for healing. For Yvonne as well, God, we pray that you would be with her as she's going to a specialist uh, for healing for her as well, God. Pray for Todd, who's um, having problems with his heart and it's, it's causing a need to be on a kidney machine, and Trish, who's having seizures. Lord, we ask for healing for both of them and for your presence to go with them. God, we pray for Connor, um, who is, has multiple connections here to this church family and community and just had a stroke on his honeymoon. Um, Lord, what a horrible, difficult thing. And God, we don't, we don't have all the details, but Lord, we pray for healing for him, that he would recover fully from the stroke, that you would bring peace to his family, to his, his new wife. Um, God, uh, that you would be so close to her uh, during this time. And Lord, we pray for the loved ones of Christian Ludwig uh, as they are mourning his passing. God, we ask for your tender mercy and care, your tender presence to be with them. God, for Marie uh, Reese, we ask for complete healing for her as she is having uh, dealing with cancer and breathing issues. God, for Dawn Reed, who is still having health issues herself um, after her compression hip fracture, we pray for continued healing and strength for Dawn. God, we pray for a sister-in-law who is diagnosed with pancreatic cancer. Um, which is spread to the liver now. Um, Lord, we, we ask for healing. We know this is very serious. But Lord, we do ask that you would do something miraculous. We ask for healing. And God, in, in the midst of all that, for your peace, for wisdom, for the family, for the doctors, and all that will come in the days ahead. Lord, for our sister Marie Katz. Oh God, we, uh, we have been praying for healing. Um, but Lord, we, we know that Marie is very ill right now and she's now in hospice. And it seems as though you may be calling her home soon. Lord God, we ask that you would do so gently, um, that she would do so in peace, that her family would sense your presence in peace at this time as well. And God, we do pray, um, as, as any time a brother or sister is called home to you, this would be an occasion where we could renew our own hope in the resurrection. God, this is not the end. Um, if you are to call Marie home now, we know we will see her again. God, we also pray for Blake Condon. God, he has some upcoming testing. Um, we thank you that the new meds are being effective, Lord, but we, we pray for a, a long-term solution for him, that it will enable him to do everything that he wants to do. Uh, Lord, we thank you for the way you've provided for the family in the midst of this. God, we continue to remember Lynn David, uh, Steve LaPointe, Linda, uh, who's continuing to have uh, pain and, and other things going on with her health, for Carol Kennedy, for Herb Lennon, um, and for Steve Fry. Lord, we give all these people to you. We give the concerns of our hearts that we've not shared with the congregation this morning to you as well. And we do it all in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to take a moment now. We're going to say an affirmation of faith, the Apostles' Creed. Uh, I invite you to do that with me. I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into Hades. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. 
From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Good morning, everybody. All right, let's, what do you think? Let's make a circle. We're gonna do it a little different today. Let's make a circle. Can you stand, okay, you come stand by me. Let's make a circle this way. Do you wanna start? We can stand up and make, uh, here, come on over here, Faith. Let's stand and make a circle. You guys good? Eric, do you wanna come make a circle with us? We are gonna, I'm gonna ask you two questions and then we're gonna pray together. First of all, can you think of somebody who is a teacher? Raise your hand when you can think of someone who's a teacher. Okay, well, let's ask everybody out here. Raise your hand if you can think of a teacher, somebody who's taught you something. We are all better when we learn new things and we're challenged to use our brains. Now, is learning always fun? No. Some, sometimes, sometimes, what does learning feel like? Does it feel hard, hard, boring, or hard, or maybe even a little frustrating? I want to have you think about something. Sometimes the hardest things to learn are actually really good. If it's always easy, we're not stretching the minds that God gave us. And so teachers have the job of helping you learn even when it's boring, even when it's hard, even when it's frustrating, and even when it's really, really fun. So uh, think of another teacher in your life. And when you think, this is a question for everybody. When you think of somebody else who's taught you something, raise your hand. Okay, put it down. Now think of another teacher in your life. Put your hand up when you think of one. Okay, put your hand down. Think of another teacher in your life. Okay, put your hand down. Think of another teacher in your life. Like seriously, are you thinking of new people each time? Yeah, actually, do you know, I just looked over at Mrs. Peterson at the piano and I thought of all the ways that she taught me and my kids music. And that was just one that I saw out of the corner of my eye. And I bet you could look at this room of people and say, there are people in this room that have taught you things too. Did you know that I used to be a teacher? Oh, so I mean, I don't know if you know this. What do you think I love to teach? I love to teach about God. I, that is my very favorite thing to teach about. You know what else I love to teach about? I like to teach math. Who likes math? I was a high school math teacher. I'm so glad that you love math. So if any of you need help with math, I'm your girl. But my favorite thing is to teach people about God. And we're going to go learn about God together this morning. Let's jump in a circle and pray for our teachers. It's the middle of September. And you have gone to school or you have learned at home now for a couple weeks. And I want you to think about the teacher you see every day. Maybe it's your mom or your dad or your grandma. But think about your teacher at school. If you're in a school, teach, think about your teacher at home, if you're at home. And we're gonna say a prayer for those teachers. Can we circle up? Let's, let's hold hands. God is the best teacher. And we're gonna go let him teach us this morning. Let's hold hands and say a quick prayer. Faith, can you hold my hand here, honey? All right, you ready? Dear Jesus, thank you so much for all the people that teach us. Thank you that learning is so good for us. And we pray for our teachers. We pray for courage and for strength and for patience. And we pray that every one of these kids, teachers, we know they see a lot of kids. And we pray that you give them opportunities to love the kids that they're teaching and opportunities to make the kids that they're teaching feel special. And Jesus, help us to remember our teachers and help us to remember to pray for him that, for them that they get what they need in the day. Strength from you, compassion from you, and patience. So God, bless us all as we go learn together this morning. And thank you for the start of a new year. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, let's walk and find All right, if our ushers will come. And let's pray together. God, we thank you. We thank you for providing 
everything we have in our lives, this whole world and everything in it belongs to you. God, you are so gracious with us. So Lord, we come now responding to your goodness, to your generosity and your graciousness as we give back. Lord, may you use these gifts, multiply them for your, for your honor, for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Mary. Have you ever heard uh, the term anti-hero? It's, it's one that gets used in movies and books and things like that. And the idea is they're in the hero role, but when you look at what they do, they're not the traditional hero. They maybe don't act morally. Um, but somehow, there's something redeemable in what they do or something about the character that still places them in the hero role. Uh, you can think about, we, we know characters like this, like uh, Jim Stark in Rebel Without a Cause, or Oscar Schindler in Schindler's List, or Harry Callahan in Dirty Harry, you know, uh, or the most contemporary one for us to think about, uh, maybe Captain Jack Sparrow in the uh, Pirates of the Caribbean. Right? I mean, they're in the hero role here, but would you want to be emulating everything that they're up to? No. So they're, they're not the traditional hero, but they're in a hero role. And the reason I bring this up is because there's, there's something in our parable that we heard read this morning that has to do with an antihero. It's one of the hardest parables that I think Jesus has given because... The parable starts in the way we would expect all parables to start. It, it creates the story world. It 
puts the characters in, in there. But then all of a sudden, the conclusion that Jesus makes at the end and the, uh, the master makes at the end seems opposite of what we would conclude as good Christian people. So what we're going to try and do is we're going to look at the parable this morning. We're going to try and unpack it a little bit and say, okay, first of all, what in the world is Jesus actually talking about here? And number two, how do we apply it to our lives? So let me just quickly lay out the story world. We heard it read. Um, if you want to look in your Bibles, it's, it's uh, Luke chapter 16 that we're going to be looking at this morning. But in the story world, there is a steward. And stewards were people that acted in a capacity for usually a really wealthy person. So if you had uh, someone that owned a large estate, they were the master of that estate, they would be off doing business here and doing business there, and they would have a steward that would execute the business that needed to be executed while they're away. So the amazing thing about these stewards is they actually had quite a bit of power. They were pretty decently well off in that society. And when the master was gone, the steward pretty much got to call the shots. And we see this, this steward character show up quite a few times in the New Testament, right? Because it was a part of their everyday world. So we get introduced to this steward. But right away, we are clued into the fact that this is not a happy day for this steward. He's called into the boss's office, and the boss says, you're doing a horrible job managing my money, my accounts. You're done. You're fired. And by the way, I want a full accounting report on my desk before you are done completely. Now, we know it's, it's an uh, extremely scary thing if we ever get let go from a job, right? You're wondering, what am I going to do? How am I going to put food on the table? That's exactly what was happening with the steward. He's thinking, what do I do next? His whole life has been thrown into disarray. He is in a crisis. He's in a crisis. And this steward, though, hatches a plan. He asks himself, First, though, what can I do? You know, I'm, I'm too old to be doing hard labor. I can't go out and work in the fields, really. And I'm too, um, I have too much pride to beg. So what can he do? And he hatches this plan, and he decides that he has some power yet before he's completely kicked off of the land, and everybody knows he's no longer the steward for this person. He goes and he calls all the different people who have accounts with his master. And you can, you can look at all the different numbers that are here. It may or may not mean anything to you. But I'll just tell you, these are large amounts of, of money. Okay, most of the accounts that are being worked with here would have been the equivalent of, you know, three years' pay for a regular person. So we're dealing with a lot of wealth and a lot of money that's, that's about to be messed with here. And what the steward decides to do is, you know, maybe, just maybe, if I go in, I call these people who have big accounts and say, hey, it's your lucky day. I can do something for you. How would you like to only owe half of what you owe right now? Well, what do you think they said? Sounds great. Uh, you might be thinking, how in the world would this ever happen? How could the steward do this? Well, in those days, if the steward did it, it's like the master did it. It's like the steward has the power of attorney, okay? Okay. And when he signs and he cashes out the money, that's it. So this is what he does. He cuts all their accounts way down, tons of money wiped off the table. And he thinks, you know, I'm going to make friends here. Because who doesn't want to have their debts cut in half? So that when I'm booted by this guy, I've ingratiated myself to these other people. And I'm going to be taken care of. Crisis averted. Right? Right? So he does this, and this is where it starts to get weird. The master comes back. He realizes what's happened. And he commends this dishonest manager for acting shrewdly. All right. Now, I mean, so this is where we have to remember we're in a parable, right? Right? And parables are meant to communicate a story. It's not exactly one-to-one -to, -one to real life, and we'll come back to that again. Because most people, if you were running a business and all of a sudden they just cut your accounts receivable in half, how do you think that they would respond? 
Not well, right? Not well. But for the purposes of the story, this master commends him. He said, well, you acted shrewdly. And then that just sort of ends the story world. Okay? You've acted shrewdly. You're commended. And then Jesus breaks in. And this is jaw-dropping. Jesus says, For the people of this world are more shrewd in dealing with their own kind than are the people of light. I tell you, use worldly wealth to gain friends for yourselves, so that when it's gone, you will be welcomed into eternal dwellings. Okay, so we're a little confused here, right? Number one, why is the master commending this guy? We already established that. And, and what I was alluding to is, remember, in the parable world, it's trying to make a story. Oftentimes, we want to make parables into allegories. Do you know what allegories are? Allegories is when you make every single character in the parable a one-to-one with something in the real world. And so in this case, we, in our minds, we want to say, well, the master here, this is talking about God. Now, the only problem with that is it may have an analogy to God, but we can't just map it completely. Because would God commend stealing? No, I'm glad you're, so you're already questioning what's happening in the parable here. Like, something's off here, you know. It seems, you know, if God is this master and he's commending this dishonesty, something's amiss, right? So, we know that this is not a one-to-one. It's not an allegory. It's an analogy. So, Jesus is going to shed some light, at least we hope. Except when Jesus goes through this, we end up even, even more confused, right? Because Jesus says two things. First, he talks about the, how the people of light aren't as shrewd as the people of this world. And it sounds like he's given the people of this world an attaboy, right? Then he goes on and he says, use the dishonest or worldly wealth to make friends so that you can be welcomed into eternal uh, dwellings. And you're thinking to yourself, okay, so how, <laughs> what, how do, how's the addition work on this? How, how are we getting from A to B, Right? It's confusing. That's why this parable is so tough. That's why this is probably one of your favorite parables, right? <laughs> so what, what can we say about the parable? What, can you bring up uh, the first slide here? Now, let's just dig a little bit deeper for a, for a moment, okay? So the master commends the dishonest manager because he had acted shrewdly. And then Jesus uh, follows up on that. For the people of this world are more shrewd in dealing with their own kind than are the people of light. We have to break this down a little bit. And, and it's, in English, it's tough to grab a hold of it. But he's saying a couple things. Number one, Christians tend to be less savvy in getting ahead than non-believers. But is, is he talking just about the world or is he talking about something else? This is the question we have to answer. Because Christians have one foot in the world and one foot in the kingdom come, right? If, if we were to mark down what Jesus talks about more than anything else, we'd probably have to say the kingdom, right? So Jesus has been trying to train his disciples in that there's a kingdom that's coming that's already breaking in with him that does things differently than the kingdom of this world, right? With me? So what Jesus is saying is not that they should be more like the world in their dishonesty, not by being unjust, Remember, it's an analogy, not an allegory. The connection point that Jesus is working with here is the crisis. Is the crisis. The people in Jesus' day needed to use this unjust steward's reaction to the crisis to make an analogy to their own life. Because, and we don't often think of this, but Jesus thought of himself this way. I didn't come to bring peace but the sword, right? When Jesus came, he recognized his coming was causing a crisis, or it should be causing a crisis in everyone who encounters him. John came preaching repentance. Jesus comes preaching repentance and the kingdom. He needs people to understand that God's purposes are moving forward, judgment is eventually coming, and it's a crisis. You need to act. You need to respond. That's what Jesus is saying over and over and over again, right? So the thing with this unjust steward that we see here in this, in this first part, it's more about how the people of this world recognize a crisis in their life and they will do 
something radical to address the crisis, okay? On the other hand, Jesus is saying the people of light are not as savvy in responding to the crisis in their own world, which is not this world, but the world to come. Okay, so let let me try and rephrase that another way. Jesus' parable is trying to help us understand the seriousness of the crisis that's coming and what that presents to this world. He's the Messiah. He's here to save, but he's pointing again to the coming kingdom, and we need to be savvy and recognize that how we operate in this world because of the crisis of Christ's arrival needs to be characterized more by the coming kingdom than by the kingdom of the world we observe all around us. Okay? That's why Jesus is saying right here that this unjust steward was savvy. He realized the predicament he was in and he adjusted to the crisis accordingly to make friends. All right, so we're going we're gonna to push further into that. We can go to the next slide. So Jesus is speaking about this eschatological crisis, the coming of judgment, the end of days. The steward recognized the crisis, responded according to the seriousness of his situation. That's the analogy. All right, let's go on to the next uh, set of verse, verses here. So he says, Jesus goes on, I tell you, use worldly wealth to gain friends for yourself so that when it's gone, you'll be welcomed into eternal dwellings. Okay, so this is about everything that an eschatological crisis brings, the whole way we behave, but the particular stories about money, right? So is Jesus concerned with everything we do and how we behave in our lives because we recognize the kingdom's coming? Yeah, you better believe it. But we're going we're gonna to stick with what he's saying, particularly about money here. And he's basically saying, put yourself in a good position through your use of money, which so easily can lead you astray, so that when this age is over, God's going to receive you into his eternal dwelling. But I think there's also a play on the friends thing here, too. Um, so, and we'll get to that. So Jesus categorizes the wealth of this world, mammon is what we call it in the Greek, as something that belongs to an order that's passing away. So he isn't telling them to be dishonest with the money. Okay? He's not saying use dishonest wealth like you're out there running scams like Robin Hood or something like that. Okay? That's not what's happening here. Jesus is just saying, you know, this is, this is money. You can't serve God in money. He goes on to talk about that, right? Money itself is being held up as an idolatrous power. Next slide. Um, so we got to address the eternal dwellings part of this, though. Because some, some people have asked me in the past, well, this sounds like work, works righteousness, right? That you're going to do something with your money and it's going to somehow make you welcome into eternal dwellings. And as I've said before, um, the New Testament is not, it's not shy about the connection between what we do and our salvation. It doesn't say you're going to earn your salvation. But there's not as much gap between how we behave and, and our faith that saves by grace through Jesus Christ. It really comes down to what James says when he says faith without works is dead, right? So, and I have the little analogy, if you tell me you're a fish and you don't spend any time in the water, what am I supposed to think? Right? So the Bible's not shy about this. This isn't works righteousness. It's the continual expectation that if we are born again, we're going to be behaved by people who are children of light, people from above. At least we ought to. We should be continually being shaped in that direction. So Jesus is not commending us to be unjust and dishonest like this steward. Jesus is saying you need to wake up, smell the coffee, and realize that what you do with what looks like wealth in this world matters. And so what is Jesus' heart about what we do with the resources we have? Anybody? Any ideas? Help others. Yeah, help others. Um, and we're going to talk about this more in a second when we, we talk about what comes. We're, we're at 11.30 already, but... Um, yeah, Jesus call for what we do with our resources. If you can say anything about it, it's that it's not self-absorbed and self-focused, right? Jesus' whole orientation with, with what we have in this life, it's, it's pointed outwards. 
You need to be considering the other. And so I think what Jesus is, is asking us here when we're thinking about how to be good stewards is to recognize that the order of this world is passing away. And what looks like wealth and riches here and now is not really wealth and riches in the grand scheme of things. And let me tell you, it's, it's, it's underscored in what we heard read. It's underscored as we push further into the chapter when we get another story about the rich man and Lazarus. You familiar with that story? Right? So we got to remember when we just pull a passage out of Scripture, it comes out of a whole context. Jesus is preaching about what matters with what we do. And the problem with the rich man and Lazarus was the rich man kept passing by Lazarus day after day after day. And what is the ultimate message of the rich man and Lazarus? Their situations were reversed, right? And Lazarus is down there begging for, 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 for mercy and for relief. Wanting to warn his family that, hey, you know, I passed by this guy every single day. And, and again, these stories aren't, aren't um, to be taken without some wisdom and some consideration. Okay, in the sense of we're getting big pictures ideas about what we do with our wealth and what we have. Everybody, hopefully you're aware, if you pass somebody that's in need every single day on the side of the street, the better thing to do might be more than just giving them money every time, right? But maybe giving some of your time or something else to see how we can really help. All right, I'm getting off rabbit trails here, but um, we need to be people, the antihero in this story, who recognize there's a, there's a world order change that's coming. There's a new kingdom that's coming. And what we do in this world can actually, you know, make friends that might want to invite us into their heavenly dwellings because of the way we behaved with what we had in this world. It's connected to our faith. It's connected with what we believe. And, and as I've said, you know, before, and we talked about this over the past four weeks, I am so aware that maintaining this kind of an understanding that what we see in front of our faces with our own two eyes and all of our senses, this world, what it says matters, the yoke it wants to put on us, it is so hard to get beyond that. And, and you know, this, this analogy, like I, I hate to, to use it because it's, it's probably been used a million times, but I think God is trying to do something for us as he comes to us time and time again, just like what happens in the movie The Matrix. Right? Blue pill, red pill. We end up being like people in The Matrix. We see everything around us. We're running. We're racing. We think we're amassing all the stuff that matters. And Jesus keeps coming and telling people, and he was telling the Pharisees in his day, and it's, and it's coming to us uh, through Scripture today, it's not the most important thing. There's permanent stuff. There's eternal things. Oh, anything we can do to rock ourselves out of the deception that we experience in this world is what Jesus wants to have happen in our lives. But we got to recognize the crisis, right? That's what happens in the matrix to it. They have to recognize it so they can make the change. So that's where the parable needs to land with us today. To really see, to recognize what's going on in the world around us and the eternal things, things that are going on behind the scenes, things that are going to matter in the long run. That's what Jesus wants us paying attention to with all that we have. Let's pray. God, open our eyes. Change our hearts. Lord, for, for so many of us, we know this. We know this, but it's so hard to have our minds renewed so we think about our lives and the world differently. Help us by the power of your Holy Spirit. Help us to have wisdom in what we do with what you've given us, whether it's large or small. Help us to consider you. Help us to be generous. Help us to have the long view. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand together as you're able. We're going to sing our sending hymn, Teach Me Your Way, O Lord.
Now receive the benediction. Now the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you now and always. Amen.